General anesthesia has been around in the United States since 1846. And one of the things that you commonly hear is that we use it every day, but we don't quite know how it works. In fact, in the United States, roughly 60,000 people receive anesthesia in some form or another to have surgery or some sort of diagnostic procedure that would be otherwise painful or traumatic. And the way we do it is something which has been handed down over the last 160 years. We use gases, we use a combination of intravenous drugs to basically render you into a state where you don't feel or don't or you're unaware of the painful procedure that you're having. So what is general anesthesia? It's a state which involves being unconscious. You don't remember, we say amnesia. You don't feel pain. You are not moving because that makes it easier for the surgeons to work. And in addition, you, we maintain stability and control of the physiological systems. Because if I took the first four things that I just mentioned, they would be synonymous with death, and that would not be cool. So what we do is we put you in this state, and then we keep your physiology, meaning your heart rate, blood pressure, stable, your body temperature, so that you can tolerate the procedure, and then we bring you out. How did we get to this point? Well, in that regard, Boston, and in particular Mass General Hospital, has a lot to do with that. Um, because the first public demonstration of anesthesia took place on April 16, 1846, at the what's now called the Ether Dome at Mass General Hospital. And on that day, uh, William Morton, who was a dentist, actually working with a surgeon, John Collins Warren, demonstrated that you could use ether to actually anesthetize, the word didn't exist, anesthetize someone for surgery. Now, why was this a big breakthrough? Well, prior to this time, the way surg surgeons, were, their ability, their skill was measured by how fast they could work. Because a lot of what they did was amputations. People would have very large infections. They would have someone who would hold you down, often maybe five, six people. Or they would give you a swig of whiskey, hoping that would sort of dull or make you insensate to the pain. It was really trauma and butchery. Well, Morton was a dentist, and he realized that he could actually put in a full dental prosthetic if he could remove his patient's teeth. So he was looking for ways to anesthetize patients. Again, the word didn't exist at the time. So he proposed to Warren this idea of using ether as an anesthetic. Again, the word didn't exist at the time. So on this day, 1846, Gilbert Abbott was brought into the ether dome. Um, Abbott administered ether. He had a sponge, which was in a flask, and he held the flask in front of uh, Abbott's face. Abbott became unconscious, unaware. The surgery was performed, and the historical accounts say that um, Warren said, this is no humbug. You know, that's 1846 speak for this is no bullshit. All right? Meaning some, something really amazing had happened. And this, it was a transformative moment. It changed surgery. In fact, word of this spread rapidly by the end of the year. This was, this was October. By the end of the year, this was known in Europe, and people were doing this you know, um, in Europe and also as far, away as, uh, as far away as Australia. So it was very, very transformative. Now, what's interesting is we still use ether today. The inhale drugs that we have people breathe for anesthesia are just glorified versions of ether. So in that sense, we've come a long ways, but in some sense, we haven't moved very far at all. But in addition to using ether, we also use a combination of drugs. So we'll use opioids or narcotics to help treat pain. We may use drugs like benzodiazepines. These are drugs which are like cousins of Valium to help you not remember. And we use drugs specifically which induce muscle relaxation. So you may have heard of curare, you know, the, the, uh, the quote-unquote poison that maybe some of the, the indigenous people in South America used on their darts when they were hunting. So we actually used to use curare, or now we use curare derivatives or drugs in another class to induce muscle relaxation. And by using a combination of drugs from different categories, we're able to provide this state, these conditions that I mentioned, so that you have mostly the good effects of the drugs with fewer of the side effects. Of the drugs that, we, that I mentioned, the one 
or the ones which are total anesthetics, meaning you could give one drug and have this effect, it would be the inhaled drugs like ether. However, if you do that, you have very profound side effects, meaning, for example, your blood pressure goes down, your heart would be depressed. So this is why you use combinations, so you can have most of the good effects of the drugs and fewer, you know, fewer of the side effects. That's how we practice. That's how we practice anesthesia now. So the way it works is kind of straightforward and simple. We monitor you. We put on blood pressure cuff, electrocardiogram. We have an oximeter, a little thing that fits on your finger. It looks like, makes your finger look kind of like ET's finger. And we use it to measure the saturation in your blood, the oxygen saturation. We measure the oxygen that we deliver. We measure the gases that we deliver. And the other reason I point out this physiological monitoring, because that was one of the big kind of breakthroughs or improvements that also came from Mass General in the mid-'80s. Around the first part of the 80s, there was kind of a bump up, a fluctuation, a Poisson fluctuation in the number of malpractice cases that we were seeing across the anesthesia departments of the Harvard hospitals. The head of the Harvard anesthesia departments got together and decided they had to do something about it. Jeff Cooper, who was the, an engineer at Mass General at the time, came up with the idea that maybe the problem was a system problem. Maybe what needed to be done was to put in place protocols that would make patients safer. And he came up with this idea that maybe what we, ha what we should have is a systematic way for monitoring the physiologic state of patients under anesthesia. And so he, along with a group of others from the kind of the, the, Harvard, um, the Harvard hospital system, came up with this paradigm for monitoring. And it was very straightforward. It just basically said, when you have anesthesia, we should monitor your heart rate and blood pressure. We should have the capability to monitor temperature, carbon dioxide, um, gas delivery, and then subsequently, oximetry was added to that. Okay? That was actually the mid-'80s. So the Harvard hospitals adopted that, I think, around 1985 and 1986. That was adopted as a national standard by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. So if you think about it, for it's only been in the last, you know, almost... 30 years or so that we actually had standards for how we monitor you. And that made a big difference. So prior to that, it was a perfectly fine if you felt it was appropriate as the anesthesiologist to just have your finger on the pulse or judge a patient's physical status by looking at you know, his or her color. And now, you know, we just take it for granted that you know, we use monitors. So that's the state of affairs. Now, what do we actually do? How does it actually start? Well, we bring you into the operating room. We may give you a sedative to help relax you a bit. And then we get all the monitors in place. We have you breathe oxygen for about two to three minutes. We fill your lungs up with oxygen. It's called either pre-oxygenation pre or actually more accurately called denitrogenation. Air is made up of 80% nitrogen roughly. So we want to replace the nitrogen in your lungs with oxygen because what we're going to do is render the patient unconscious, usually fairly rapidly, within about 30 to 40 seconds. And at that time, the patient is going to stop breathing. Now, what we have to do is be able to take over the airway and manually control the patient's ability to breathe. We'll actually breathe for them. Sometimes that gets to be a problem. So if there's difficulty, if they've been pre-oxygenated so that you create kind of a margin of safety. So that's what we'll do for the first you know, about two to three minutes. Then when everything is all set, through an intravenous line, we'll administer a drug which will induce anesthesia, which is typically now propofol. It's the most widely used anesthetic, and we administer the propofol, the patient becomes anesthetic, excuse me, the patient becomes unconscious, and then what happens is we, um, we administer a muscle relaxant once we know that we can ventilate you. What this does is it makes it, the body relaxes and it makes it easier for the anesthesiologist to, pr to place the, 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 the breathing tube because we actually, we actually uh, we, you're, you're completely unconscious and we're going to usually control your, your breathing, your ventilation while you're under anesthesia. The tube is taped in place. We make sure that it's in good position. Then we start a series of other drugs, maybe an infusion, maybe one of propofol with narcotic, maybe start an inhaled drug, 
We'll give you antibiotics to protect against infection. We'll give you drugs to help you to help you from become to keep you from becoming sick to your stomach. We may at the end of the case we may reverse the muscle relaxant. So in the course of a typical anesthetic, in addition to giving oxygen and and uh, let's say fluids to keep you all hydrated, you receive a minimum of ten drugs right there. And so it's by controlling the flows of these various drugs that we keep you in this state of anesthesia. We maintain you there. When it looks like the, the surgery is about to end, we dial back on the drugs, and the anesthesiologist times it based on his or her experience and what, where he sees the surgeon to be in the case, and then allows the patient to recover. And when it's clear that the, the effects of the drugs have sufficiently worn off, the patient can again breathe on his own. The breathing tube is removed. The patient's examined, and, we're, and the patient is taken back to the, uh, is taken to the recovery room. After Morton had this first successful demonstration of anesthesia, October 16, 1846, he wrote to Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., who's the father of the Supreme Court Justice. He's a professor of physiology at Harvard Medical School. And he asked him to help him come up with the word to describe what he had done. And it was Holmes who came up with the term anesthesia, meaning insensate, not feeling any pain or sensation. I thought I should mention that just because how could we talk about anesthesia without me telling you where it came from? Now, what's the mystery? Well, the mystery is the following. It's actually interesting that you can give a simple, a single drug. Ether is a very, very small molecule. And you can render a patient into a state that you can actually conduct an operation on them. How does that happen? Up until now, I think most anesthesiologists and anesthesia researchers would tell you, we really don't know. So therein lies the mystery of anesthesia. We can do this reliably on a day-to-day -day basis. As I said, 60,000 people a day get some form of anesthesia across in the United States. But yet, how it actually occurs or what's actually transpiring in the brain remains essentially unknown. That makes very clear where research should go or has to go. So molecular level, behavioral level, the link in between are really the neural circuits in the brain and in the central nervous system. In other, in other words, understanding how binding to certain receptors in certain parts of the brain and having effects on neural circuits then lead to the behavioral states that we see. So if you put that in the context of the way neuroscientists think about it, that's a systems neuroscience question. Because what systems neuroscience is all about is taking a particular system, let's say like the hippocampus to study memory, performing an experiment which stimulates or activates that area in some way or another, and then recording the responses. And from that, learning how that part of the brain works. So the same thing is true here, having hypotheses about where in the brain the anesthetics are working, and then using neurophysiological recording paradigms in animals and non-human primates in humans, to then understand how the action in a particular part of the brain induces the behavior. So that's the mystery, and those are the approaches that are currently being taken. <laughs>